And so if you have your Bibles, we're in James chapter 3. Anybody been encouraged to start the year uh, by the book of James besides me? Anybody grateful for the book of James? If this is your first time at Way Church, uh, my name is Noah, and I have the honor of serving as the lead pastor of Way Church. And we have been going week by week, verse by verse, through the entire book of James for the past seven weeks. This is week seven. Somebody say seven. <laughs> week seven. And uh, seven is one of my favorite numbers, so this has got to be a good week right here. Um, our series is called From Talk to Walk, because the book of James is actually written by a man named James, who uh, I affectionately like to call the Blue Collar Scholar. Uh, the Blue Collar Scholar, James, was a smart guy, but he was also a guy who really, really, really wanted followers of Jesus to not just talk about their relationship with Jesus, but to actually walk out their relationship with Jesus. And so every single week, what we've seen is we've seen James cover a, a wide array, really, of topics, uh, but he keeps coming back to this idea that faith without works is dead, and that as followers of Jesus, we can't just say we follow Jesus, we actually have to live like a Jesus follower. And so I'm really, really excited. Last week, my faith was, was deeply encouraged uh, from Maddie's message on words. Did anybody like Maddie's message last week on words? I loved it. I'm her husband. I have to love it. But even if I wasn't, I would have loved it. It was deeply encouraging to me. And um, we're actually going to kind of build on last week's message on words in James chapter 3. He goes from talking about words to talking about wisdom. And so uh, the title of my message this morning is Wisdom Walks. Will you say that with me? Ready? One, two, three. Wisdom Walks. Wisdom Walks. God, we, uh, we welcome you. We thank you for our time together. We pray that as we open up your word that you would speak to us in a real and in a tangible way. We love you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing Raising Canes to Nashville, Tennessee. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Um, Maddie and I have two kids, two kids. We have a two-year-old and a nine-month-old, and we are firm believers that parenthood is the best hood. That's what we're believers in. We love being parents, but there are some things that you just don't know until you know. There are some things that you just don't know until you know. At 26 years old, uh, without children, this is three years ago, 26 years old, without children, I thought that I knew how to parent. This is true. Uh, at 26 years old, I really did think that I knew how to parent. And one of the things that I really wish I could do right now as a 29-year-old with two kids is I wish I could travel back in time and slap 26-year-old Noah right upside the head. I just wish I could do it one time. Just pacha, like just bro. Okay. I remember before kids, I would get on an airplane and I would hear kids crying on the plane and I would like, don't judge me, uh, parents. Okay. I, I would be on that airplane and I would roll my eyes and I would think that is poor parenting right there. Okay. <laughs> But 29-year-old Noah gets on an airplane with screaming, crying kids, and he is encouraged, okay? I'm like, my faith is encouraged in that moment. I'm like grabbing my wife. I'm like, babe, do you hear that? Do you hear that? They don't get it either. They don't know how to do this either. I'm like recording it so I can listen to it on a rainy day. Uh, because some things you just don't know until you know. I remember before kids, I, I would think, man, when I have kids, they're going to have a steady, balanced diet of fruits and vegetables. I mean, they're going to eat so many plants. It's going to be insane. We are going to sell out the plant store. That's how many plants they're going to eat. And now I'm a dad. And um, yesterday, I'm sitting on the couch, and my son, Lion, he's two. Over and over and over again, he's saying this. Dad, can I have more marshmallows? Dad, can I have more marshmallows? Dad, can I have more? I mean, he probably said it 117 times in a row. And I'm just trying my best to ignore him. I'm trying my best to study for the sermon. I'm just, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. True story, two-year-old son walks in front of my computer, literally in front of me at the, at the dinner table, stares me in the eyes, and he goes, Noah, give me more marshmallows. <laughs> I just gave him the whole bag. I just, 
I wasn't prepared emotionally for that to happen. I just, here, have them. You can have all the marshmallows. This wasn't ready. Some things you don't know until you know. Uh, a couple weeks ago, my wife and I, we went to Outback Steakhouse on a date night. Okay, we went to Outback Steakhouse. Anybody like Outback Steakhouse? Okay, went to Outback Steakhouse. We brought the kids, okay, because babysitting ain't cheap. So we were like, let's bring the kids on this date night. Like, let's come on. And so we go to Outback Steakhouse, and we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, my son is behaving totally fine. And all of a sudden, he grabs a piece of the blooming onion and throws it and hits our waitress's face. This is a true story. What do you do when that happens? It's not in the parenting book, okay? Uh, I'll tell you what you do. You just laugh, okay, because that's all you can do. And you say, now that is a zooming onion right there. That's a zooming onion. It was blooming and now it's zooming. Uh, what I'm trying to tell you is before kids, I could have I wrote a book on parenting. But after kids, I'm burning that book, okay? I need to read some books on parenting because there are just some things that you don't know until you know. Some things you don't know until you know. Uh, James, in James chapter 3, is addressing a group of people who think they know about wisdom, but they don't really know about wisdom. They have an idea of what wisdom is supposed to be. They have, they have this presupposition of what wisdom looks like, and he is directly addressing them and saying, no, 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 you have the wrong idea. If you don't know, now you know. That's what he's saying. If you don't know, now you know. Their idea of wisdom is all about IQ. It's all about uh, intellectual knowledge. It's about the accumulation of knowledge. And what we're about to see in James chapter 3 is that James doesn't believe that wisdom is about the accumulation of knowledge as much as it is about applying the knowledge that you already have. That's what James wants us to see in James chapter 3, starting in verse 13. This is what he says. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. We're going to stop right there for just a second. James' definition of wisdom is that wisdom belongs to people who, number one, live a good life, number two, who uh, do good deeds, and number three, do both of those things with humility. One of my favorite preachers, a man named Tony Evans, he's in his late 60s now, been preaching for about 40-something years. His definition of wisdom is this. Wisdom is the application of heavenly knowledge to earthly living. I love that. It's the application of heavenly knowledge to earthly living. Both of these men, Tony Evans and James, would say, it's great that you know a lot about God, but how good how well do you obey him? It's amazing that you read your Bible every day. But what do you do with the words in this book? Do you hear them or do you do them? It reminds me of the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine puts them into practice. Is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. Both builders heard the word, but only one of them obeyed the word, and that is the one that was called wise. This is what James is trying to, to get us to see right off the jump right here. It's that your level of wisdom is directly attached to your level of obedience. You can't say you're wise if you don't obey. You can't, you can't, what you have is not wisdom, what you have is knowledge. And what Jesus wants for you and for me, what we desperately need to navigate life in 2024 and family in 2024 and jobs in 2024, we don't need knowledge, we need wisdom. And if you want wisdom, it's not just about knowing, it's about doing. It makes me think of uh, something called an armchair quarterback. Have you ever heard of an armchair quarterback? Do you know what this is? Anybody? Nobody knows what. Okay, one. All right. Armchair quarterback, just, just so we're all on the same page, is somebody who watches a game and talks about the game a lot. Um, it, it actually might be better for me to, uh, to describe an armchair quarterback situation. So um, a couple years ago, I was, I was watching – football with uh with my friend and it was his team versus my team 
And uh, his team was losing because my team doesn't lose a lot. I'm a fan of the Georgia Bulldogs. We won back-to-back -back national championships. And uh, it would have been three, but uh, the NCAA is rigged. So um, we, you know, we're, we're pretty good. And so we're, we're beating uh, this, this guy's team. And uh, honestly, I wasn't enjoying watching the game very much because my friend, who is a great dude, he just turns into a totally different guy when he watches football, especially when his team is losing to mine. And so we're watching this game, and he's just yelling at the TV. I mean, every single play, he's talking about what his quarterback should be doing, why what he's doing is wrong. He, he's like telling, like, like the quarterback can hear him or something. He's like telling him where he should throw it and where he shouldn't throw it. And finally, about halfway through the game, um, I, I was genuinely curious because I didn't know the answer to the question. I just said, hey, did you play quarterback in high school or did you play quarterback in college? Like, is that how you know what this guy should be doing? And he was like, oh, no, man, I, I didn't even play football. And I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, I was in the band. And I was like, I mean, that's amazing. Like, no hate on band, on band but, like, that's, that's weird because the way you're talking about this game makes me think, like, you know what this guy should be doing. Like, like, he was talking a lot, but he hadn't really done a lot. And I just want to say this with as much grace and as much love as possible. The kingdom of God does not need more armchair quarterbacks. The kingdom of God does not need more people who are like, this is what we should do. This is what you shouldn't do. Just critiquing and picking out. What the kingdom of God needs is people who say, I want to obey what God has told me to do. I want to put some skin into the game. I don't want to just talk. I want to walk it out. I want to be somebody who hears the word of God and obeys the word of God. It's great if you know the word of God. I hope you read your Bible. I hope you memorize your Bible. But what I hope even more is that you apply it. It's that you go from knowledge to wisdom. It, it, you go from talking to walking. This is what James is urging us to do. He says that wisdom is the combination of living a good life, doing good deeds, but it's the application that includes living with humility. Living with humility. Um, do you have a favorite outfit? This one's mine. My wife just bought me these blue pants uh, a couple days ago. And uh, I know some of you guys are in the back. I'm going to back up so you can see. They're blue pants. They're a little baggy uh, for me. I, I'm still getting used to all the room. Uh, Gen Z brought the baggy pants in. And uh, all the millennials, we still got closets full of skinny jeans. We're like, what do we do? And so my wife bought me these blue pants. And I was a little insecure about it at first because they're a little baggy. And she was like, no, I think they look really good on you. And so when she said that, it became my favorite outfit. <laughs> now, what I know about fashion is that I'm going to look back on current me, and I'm going to hate this outfit. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. Uh, like today, I'm feeling it. I'm, I'm feeling good. Like uh, when, before I walked out the door today, my wife was like, you look great, babe. And I was like, this is my favorite outfit. Um, I'm feeling really good today. I just, I'm feeling good. But what I know is 10 years from now, may, maybe 20 years from now, I'm going to look back at the little thumbnail picture of this sermon, and I'm going to be like, what was I wearing on, on, on February 18th, 2024? Like what was I wearing? Uh, have, has this already happened to you? Like you look back on like your yearbook photo or you look back on like 10 years ago, 20, you're like, what was I doing? Like someone should have told me. Did, like you like start texting people. Did you not love me? You know, like, like why didn't you speak the truth in love to your boy? What was I wearing? Um, there is this really interesting scripture in Colossians that says that we should clothe ourselves in humility, that we should clothe ourselves in humility. The thing that will always look good on you, no matter what season of life you're in, is humility. Humility. When you walk around with a humble spirit, everybody likes what you're wearing. Everybody likes the way that you're talking. You want to talk about the people that, that, that we collectively as human beings love to be around? It's humble people. The type of leaders that we like to serve, humble leaders. The type of bosses that we like to, to work under, humble bosses. The type of spouses that we like to marry, humble spouses. People love humility, and it doesn't matter how many years go by, we are attracted. We love people who carry a spirit of humility. But the opposite is true. Pride is an ugly outfit. Every season, there is not a single season of life that pride is attractive. Pride over time, the, the, the thing about pride that's, that's crazy is a lot of times you're the last person to see you have it. 
And pride over time just starts to uh, repel people from your life. Uh, People don't want to serve a prideful person. They don't want to be around a prideful person. They don't want to walk in relationship with a prideful person. Pride says, look at me. Pride says, look at what I'm doing. Pride says, look at what I'm accomplishing. Look what I'm building. But humility says, look what God's building. Look what God's accomplishing. Look what God is doing. You got to understand what is happening in your life. Very little of what we do or accomplish or succeed in is because of us. Very little. At Way Church, we have this statement, only God. Many of you, you were here in the fall when we went through that series, Only God. We, we don't want this to just be something that, that we say. We want it to be something that we really mean. What's happening at Way Church, it's not because of us. It's because of God. It's not us who built this church. It's God who built this church. It's not us who get the credit. It's only God who gets the credit. We're just nobody's trying to tell everybody about a somebody who can change our life. It is because of Jesus. We want to live in humility because when we live with pride, God can't use us anymore. But when we live with humility, God can continue to pour out his spirit on us. He trusts us with more, and we look good in every season. Come on, somebody, if you love fashion, say amen. (laughs) Amen. Clothe yourself in humility. Verse 14, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition, if you're taking notes, I just want you to underline that word, selfish ambition. If you harbor bitter envy, and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. Okay, are you ready for this? This is, to me, the heart of where James is going right here. There is a difference between selfish ambition and holy ambition. There's a difference. James says selfish ambition, stay away from it. Stay away. Not supposed to have selfish ambition as followers of Jesus. But this is not what James said. He did not say, go, be lazy, stay away from hard work, don't do things with excellence. That's not what James said. Uh, We don't get to take this scripture that says do nothing out of selfish ambition as a reason to uh, just be apathetic at work, just just not care about our callings, just not put effort forth in our lives. That's not what James is saying. In fact, the Bible is full of scriptures that urge against that. Uh, Proverbs 13, 4 says, lazy people want much but get little, but those who work hard will prosper. I think about Paul. Uh, Paul was a business owner. He was a church planter. He was a writer. He was a speaker. Uh, It doesn't seem like Paul was a lazy guy. It doesn't seem like Paul just was like, I don't care what happens with my life. To me, it looks like Paul had some ambition inside of him. And in in Ephesians chapter 4, we are urged to live a life that is worthy of the calling that we've received. We're urged to, to live a life that's worthy of the calling that we've received. And we've received a calling from God himself. So that is a, a big type of life that we're called to. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, we learn that leadership is literally, this is what the quote says, leadership is an honorable ambition. Meaning, big takeaway here, that there are more than one types of ambition that we can have in our life. There's a holy ambition and there's a selfish ambition. So what's the difference? Because you don't want selfish ambition and you do want holy ambition. Selfish ambition is the desire to build your kingdom. Holy ambition is the desire to build God's kingdom. Selfish ambition is about helping yourself out. A holy ambition is about helping others out. Selfish ambition absorbs all the glory for yourself, but a holy ambition reflects all the glory back to where it belongs. There's a difference between a selfish ambition and a holy ambition. I just want to maybe break it down a little bit more here. Uh, God wants you to be the best doctor that you can be if you're a doctor. God wants you to be the best teacher, the best parent, the best coach, the best spouse. He wants you to be the best that you possibly can be. He just wants you to do it for the good of other people and for the glory of his name. He just wants you to do it with the spirit of humility. He wants you to do it while you're actively saying all the glory from my life goes to Jesus Christ. I am not praying for less ambitious people to be a part of Way Church. I'm praying for more ambitious people to be a part of 
of Way Church. I think what our world needs is Christians who have the right kind of ambition. Yes, I'm, I'm showing up. Yes, I'm doing the best that I can. Yes, I'm going to do things with excellence. I'm just going to make sure that every single person who sees my life knows that it's not me doing it, that it's God who's doing it. I'm just going to make sure that every single person that knows me knows that I'm on a mission to help others, not to help myself. I've got some holy ambition. I'm praying that more people at Way Church will show up and go, I'm living a life for other people. I'm praying that more people at Way Church will say, I'm going to make sure that I give more than I receive. I'm praying that more people at Way Church show up and say, I want to build the kingdom of God, and that requires a little bit of holy ambition. There's a difference between selfish ambition and holy ambition. A couple years ago, uh, I got to go to Israel, and one of the coolest experiences um, that I got to be a part of in Israel was I got to swim in uh, the Dead Sea. And um, if you've ever been in the Dead Sea, you know you don't actually have to swim. You, you actually float, like, on top of the water. It's this really, really crazy experience. Like, I know that you always float. You're like, dude, that's weird. You always float on top of the water. It's, it's different. It's like, uh, you know when you're floating in a swimming pool and, like, half your body goes underwater? It's not like that. It's like you're on top of the water. Like, it's just this really unique body of water. And so we're all kind of floating around, all these awkward pastors floating around in the, in the Dead Sea, you know, trying to be cool. And we just look like weird dads. And we're floating around. And, um, and our tour guide starts talking about the Dead Sea. And he's telling us all these interesting facts. But there was one thing that he said that really stuck out to me. He said, the Dead Sea is one of the only bodies of water in the world that receives water from multiple sources of water, Okay, from, from different uh, rivers and streams and, and those types of things. But it does not give water to any other source of water. So it's constantly receiving and never giving, and it's called the Dead Sea. I don't think that's a coincidence. Because the fastest way to kill your soul is to be a Christian who always receives and never gives. Always receiving, never giving back. Always being poured into, never pouring out. Always being discipled, never making disciples. Always listening to sermons, never pouring back out on others. Always having your time be, be your time and never giving your time back to the Lord. I really, really want us to get this today. It's that we are called as followers of Jesus to pour out. The Bible says you were made in the image of God. You serve a God who gave. He gave his only son to die for your sins and for my sins. He gave you a new name. He gave you a hope and a future. He gave you plans to prosper you and not to harm you. He gave you a new life that you do not deserve. He gave. And as followers of Jesus, we are called to, to, uh, to live out that same example and to give. What is God asking you to give? What, what has God given you that maybe, maybe by accident, maybe by intention, you've been storing up for yourselves? I think a great biblical model for this question and just to think through is the idea of the three T's. We, we see this in a parable that Jesus teaches on, uh, the time, the talent, and the treasure. Has, has Jesus given you time, the gift of time, and you've been thinking that the time is all for yourself? Maybe God's asking you today to give some of your time. Maybe give, give some of your time to pour into other people. Give some of your time to love on other people. When you look at your calendar, is it, is it all about you or is there places in your calendar where your time is about other people? Your talents. You know, God has given each of us different amounts of talents, mine are very small amount. But when you look at your talent, what are you doing with your talent? Is it all about you or is there a way that you could start using the talents God has given you for other people? Is there a way that God could, God could take those giftings that he's poured out on you and you could use it to be a blessing to others and to the glory of his name? And then the last one is the most simple, your treasure. Has God blessed you? The answer is yes. What are we doing with our treasure? What are we, what are we doing with the treasure that God's given us? Is it just for us? Is it just for nicer meals and nicer things? Or are we taking the treasure God's given us and... and investing it into the kingdom. That's why we talk about tithing almost every week. That's why we talk about giving almost every week. I know that in church, people get nervous when, 
when the pastor talks about giving, but Jesus didn't get nervous to talk about giving. Jesus talked about money more than any other subject. And in November, we did a whole sermon on giving and we did this only God offering that was really, really powerful. But we're gonna continue to talk about giving at Way Church, not because we want something from you, but because we want something for you. Because we understand what Jesus was saying. He was saying, you cannot have a person's heart until you have their money. It's just, it's just too hard. The, the greatest uh, distraction to God being God in our life is our money. That's, what, that's why Jesus talked about it so much. And so when, when you give at Way Church, when you, when you give to a local church, not only are you obeying God's word, but you're, you're telling your soul and you're telling God at the same time, this money that you blessed me with, I, I realize, I understand it's not just for me. It's for others. I'm pouring out. I'm pouring out. And over and over and over again, God blesses it. This is what God's word says. Luke 6, verse 38, give away your life and you'll find life given back with bonus and with blessing. Winston Churchill said this, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. So good. Okay, in summary, holy ambition is good. Selfish ambition is bad. Holy ambition is good. Selfish ambition is bad. It's the motivation behind the ambition that tells us which one we have. Okay, so a couple, couple examples. A person with selfish ambition wants to make more money so that they can get a bigger, a bigger house, so that they can get a nicer car, and so they, they can continue to keep up with the Joneses in Nashville, Tennessee. That's, that's a selfish ambition. I want to make more money so I can have this, so I can have this, and so people can see me like this. But a holy ambition says, I want to make more money so I can get a bigger house so I can host more people at my way group. See what I did there? I just taught and I did an infomercial for way groups, which are amazing, by the way. A holy ambition says, I want to make more money because I want to give more money away. One of, my, one of the most inspiring things to me was when I was 22 years old, I met a guy. He started discipling me. We started meeting at, uh, for coffee in Cleveland, Tennessee at a little Starbucks. And one of the most inspiring things to me was when I asked him if he tithed, he said, yes, we started tithing a few years ago, but now we give 22%. And I was like, first of all, that's a very specific number that you give. You give 22% of your income. He said, yeah, our goal is to get it to 30%. And I was like, man, this is wild. He's like, we track it because what we see, we see our money as an investment into the kingdom of God, and we want to invest more and more over time. It was just so inspiring to me because I always was like, I got to get to 10%. I got to figure out a way to get to 10%. But what you find with people who are truly, truly operating in the gift of generosity is they're just like, I got to figure out a way to make more money so I can give more money. It's inspiring. That's a, that's a holy ambition versus a selfish ambition. Does that make sense? Here's another example. A selfish ambition wants to become the CEO so that people will think highly of them, so that their reputation will grow, and so that people will go, oh, they're smart, hardworking, and they grind it. That's a selfish ambition. A holy ambition wants to become the CEO of the company so they can implement policies that help other people, so that they can show others that you can do things with excellence and love other people at the same time, so that they can be the CEO and they can make an impact on their company and be a witness to Jesus Christ in the process. There's a difference between a selfish ambition and a holy ambition. I believe with all my heart, God wants you to be ambitious. He just wants the motivation behind it to be about him and not you. That's what God wants. And here's the thing about ambition. Nobody knows if you're being selfishly ambitious or wholly ambitious except for you and God. One of the most dangerous things as a follower of Jesus is for you to try and judge another person's ambition. The only person's heart who gets messed up when you try to figure out another person's type of ambition is yours. You're, it's the only heart that gets hurt. People say, uh, only God can judge me. And it's not totally true. Um, there are other people that can judge you, but God will judge you one day. And so let that be enough. If you, if you see someone and it seems like they have selfish ambition, you don't have to try to fix them. Maybe if you have a relationship, you can encourage, you can correct them in love. But really what we should be doing, we should be, we should be asking ourselves the question, do I have selfish ambition? Am I operating in holy ambition? Or am I trying to build my own kingdom? Okay, it took too long. Let's keep going. J. Oswald Sanders, who wrote arguably the greatest uh, leadership 
Christian book on the planet. It's called Spiritual Leadership. He said this, ambition focused on the glory of God and the good of God's people is a mighty force for good in this world. Mighty force for good in this world. Uh, today, after our second service, we have Waytrack and highly encourage you to go through Waytrack if you haven't gone through it yet. Uh, we have had something like 70 people go through Waytrack this year already, which is incredible. It's simply uh, a way for you to hear more about our church and then get more involved at our church. And at the very end of Waytrack, we give people an opportunity to sign up for a serve team. We have 160 something people who serve at Way Church every week. If you're a Waymaker, why don't you just clap your hands for yourself? Come on. Um, and what we do is we, we pop up this list of teams and we say, hey, you can fill out this card if you want to join one of our serve teams here and you can mark which ones you would prefer to serve on. And so people mark, hey, I'd rather, you know, serve in this area or this area. But something we regularly do at Way Church is we reach out to people who signed up to serve in one area and we ask them to serve in another area. We, we say, hey, I know you signed up for, for the worship team, but would you mind actually serving in kids ministry for the next couple months because we have a bigger need in kids ministry than we do on the worship team right now. And over and over and over again, people say, yeah, put me where the need is. Because this is the culture that we're trying to develop, a, a culture around a holy ambition versus a selfish ambition. We're trying to say, hey, the, the mission of the church is more important than the mission of me. Hey, the need of the church is more important than the preference of me. This is the type of culture we're trying to build. It's always outward facing. It's always about what God wants, what God's desiring over what I need, what I want, and what I desire. Okay, verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Verse 17 is full of adjectives, and uh, I just wrote down those adjectives without it being in a sentence. These are the adjectives, pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, impartial, sincere. James is describing the kind of wisdom that comes from putting God's word into practice. He's using adjectives to describe the type of wisdom that you and I need to follow Jesus in 2024, but he's also describing a person. Those adjectives describe good wisdom, but they also describe Jesus. Pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, sincere. He, it's wisdom, but it's also who Jesus is. I think the context of this letter in James is really important for us. James is writing to this group of people about 20 years after Jesus has ascended into heaven. And the question that I was asking as I was reading the end of this chapter was, what would they have been thinking about? You know, these people who, most of which that are getting this letter, they actually watched Jesus in person. They got to see him live. They got to hear his teachings. They got to follow Jesus in human form. And now they're at this time when they're being persecuted, when they're being hated and chased down for their faith, where, where just all these, these horrible things are happening. And on a daily basis, they are needing wisdom. And James concludes the chapter by saying, the wisdom that comes from heaven. Where is Jesus when these people are reading this letter? Where is Jesus today? It's not a trick question. It's a theological question. And in Hebrews chapter one, verse one through three, we learn that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the father in heaven. So right now, and when James, the book of James was written, Jesus was sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And so when James is writing this letter and he says, wisdom comes from above, it wasn't like this statement that's like, oh yeah, thank you for this abstract aboveness that's sending me wisdom. James was alluding to the fact that Jesus is up in heaven right now and all wisdom comes from him. He is the embodiment of wisdom. And so, when we pray for wisdom, what we're asking for is Jesus to send down this wisdom from above. This is encouraging to me. Um, the last nine years I've been in full-time ministry, probably the question that I've been asked more than any other question, seriously, I was trying to think if there's one more than this. It, it's always around this idea of how do I know what's God and what's not? How do I know which decision is God's decision and which decision is, is maybe my flesh's decision. Uh, how do I know if this is my calling or, or this isn't? 
Maybe you feel that way right now. Maybe right now you're trying to figure out big life decisions. You're trying to figure out family plans. You're trying to figure out career plans. And so you need wisdom. You, you need help. You're like, I, how do I, I don't want to miss my calling. This just totally set me free. This idea that if you don't want to miss your calling, stick close to the one who called you. If you want to make wise decisions, stick close to the person who has all wisdom. Because wisdom walks. Jesus walks. It's the most life-giving thing. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Jesus says, come to me all who are tired, who are weary, who are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest for your souls. He's, Jesus says, I have an easy yoke and a light burden. Come and walk with me. The message translation says, come and learn the unforced rhythms of my grace. You can't learn the unforced rhythms of Jesus' grace if you're not walking with him. If you're, if you're not talking with him. But when you walk with Jesus, he, here's, here's what's just given me life today. As I, my OCD self, my type A self is trying to plan out the next eight and a half years of our lives and trying to make all the right decisions. When you're walking with Jesus, you might take a wrong turn and you can still end up at the right destination. You might make a wrong choice and Jesus can still get you to the right place. Just keep getting up. Just keep walking with Jesus. Just keep, just keep talking with Jesus. Just keep protecting your quiet time. Just keep worshiping Jesus. Just keep getting around people who are sharpening your faith. Just keep finding yourself in the presence of God and walking with wisdom. Can I pray for you? Will you stand to your feet? Jesus, we thank you for your presence. That's in this room. We thank you that you are moving, that you see us, that you care for us. God, I pray for every person in this room that has a big decision on their mind today. God, I pray that you would just give them peace that surpasses all understanding right now. God, I pray that they would see and that they would believe and that they would know that you care about the details of their life. That they don't have to figure out the next 17 steps if they'll just stick close with you. God, I pray that you would be with them today, that you would give them peace. God, not clarity, but peace. Peace to trust you. God, I pray that we would never idolize clarity, but that we would always learn to trust you, that we would learn to walk with you. We love you, Jesus.